So Bryant, why can't big tech companies with all of their resources do what New Sapiens is doing? Well, of course, with their resources, with their vast resources, uh, theoretically, of course, um, they can do anything. And they have a lot of really smart people, talent, and technology. I think in that sense, the real question is, why haven't they? And why aren't they? And that is a question whose answers, I think, have many levels. Uh, the obvious one, of course, uh, is that uh, what New Sapiens is doing has required a number of um, breakthroughs um, and uh, that have required us to be truly innovative. Uh, and very large organizations like our big tech companies are not known for being very innovative. Why is that? Well, I think it has to do with the psychology of people in large organizations and how decisions are made and how uh, the creative impulses of any one individual is absorbed or echoed into the larger or organization with many levels of decision making. And that's just the way it is. It's not a criticism of the big tech companies. It's just how human beings and human nature is in large organizations, not known for being very innovative or to be able to move quickly. Uh, I think uh, that is why, of, of course, that there has always been uh, a, what's been called a cherished American ideal that started in, uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, the notion of uh, the garage startup, which a couple of people uh, working together independently come up with some brilliant new idea or insight or innovation, uh, and uh, they take it and run with it and uh, end up building a, a uh, developing a technology and building it into a company and that company grows to change or disrupt entire industries. Now that has happened and been repeated many times. In fact, um, all of today's big tech companies, the great big five of all worth up to close to a trillion dollars uh, in market cap, they all started out that way. You know, Microsoft, uh, I mean, even before, even for the big techs, you you would Packard at uh, Microsoft uh, and uh, Apple, of course, um, Google, all just with a handful of people. Uh, so, but that is not the narrative we have today. Uh, as the internet really took hold, and those winners in the internet sweepstakes like uh, started to come to for grow bigger and bigger and bigger, a new narrative emerged, and that narrative was that well, the truly the companies that are truly the most valuable companies aren't necessarily small and innovative because of their um, individuals involved, but uh, companies that were large and rich in resources and user data. And then that then has affected and uh, the growth uh, the growth out of that kind of uh, predisposed these big companies toward a certain approach to what we call artificial intelligence, which again is a bucket term. It really means anything you want it to mean. And uh, it's meant many different things in the past and the same term has been used to refer to many different technologies that really have very little to do with each other, if, if anything. Uh, and that's certainly true today. But with the idea that the real wealth of a company was in, was in data and vast quantities of data, particularly user data, then, uh, you don't have the need or you're not paying attention to the idea of individual innovation. And the technology that came forward, which was just perfect for that viewpoint, was machine learning. And uh, that approach to AI, which was based on having vast data sets. And along with this narrative of bigness, lots of use, user data, huge resources, huge computational resources, giant data sets, um, that technology of uh, being able to analyze patterns in these huge data sets, particularly early on or even today, patterns in users' behavior, what, where are people clicking? That was the magic that spun user data into advertising gold for the big tech companies. And all the big tech companies today are very, very focused on advertising revenues, particularly Google and Facebook. It's all about clicking. For them, that is AI. It is machine learning on large data sets. So why have they not been able to do what this new sapiens is doing? Is well, A, they're not trying, but B, their culture is completely 180 degrees uh, 
directed the other way. The whole notion that they see is AI is about handling these vast quantities of data. Now, I think it's also a really important and valid question to take it outside a little broader context, not just the big tech companies, but the entire uh, technical community surrounding the big tech companies and supporting the tech companies. And I mean uh, academia and, uh, um, and, and, and the entire uh, mainstream uh, of what you might call computer science and or uh, artificial intelligence community today. And so look at, look at where that's come from. And uh, basically, uh, if you go back to the origins in the beginning, of artificial intelligence. The term was first coined uh, back in 1956 at a call for papers, uh, rather a call for a summer research project at Dartmouth. And that is where the term, term AI was first coined. They were very optimistic in the language of that, that conference uh, calling for it. Um, they basically stated that it, it was based on a conjecture that no feature of intelligence, meaning human intelligence, that's the only intelligence we, we could refer to at the time, that no feature of it could not be emulated or simulated uh, using computers, computer software. So the notion was that this new thing called artificial intelligence would be a matter of emulating or simulating uh, features of human intelligence, if it was clear what those were. <laughs> Uh, and so it's been a feature of imitation. And now that, of course, is not an unreasonable approach. If you think AI is a good deal, uh, then where are you going to learn how to do it? Well, you would study the only example you have, which is human intelligence. But when you stop and think about that, depending on the approach you take to that, uh, that's very difficult, much more difficult than it seems to them at the time because we don't know how the brain, which is understood to be the seat of human intelligence, we have no idea about how it works really. It's very, very complicated. It may be the most complicated single thing uh, in the universe, as far as we are aware, it's hugely complex. And it was created through an evolutionary process that took many millions of years uh, in parallel with many other creatures or evolving at the same time, but only one of them achieved uh, intelligence as we recognize it in ourselves. So they would, so AI up to now has been um, kind of a trial and error thing. Well, let's try this. So, uh, and I go back uh, nearly three decades now in the AI community, not back to 1956, but a few years later. Uh, and it's always been a case that somebody who was wanted to solve the problem of intelligence and machines, we come up with some kind of theory about how humans do it, uh, about some particular, maybe a, an algorithmic approach. For instance, one that was very popular um, going back and actually probably instrumental in the, in the ultimate rise of uh, machine learning was the idea that it's about statistics, particularly Bayesian statistics, uh, maybe justified by the speculation that human beings seem to be able to reason about things even when they don't have complete data. So they don't have complete data to make a deterministic uh, conclusion when regarded to a logical problem. You apply statistics and kind of make an educated guess on what the probable answer might be. And that led uh, people down a certain road. Now, when you talk about innovation, and invention. Um, and you look back at the history of, of technology, uh, you see that uh, many inventions come along kind of when it is their time to come along. And uh, one, a good example of that would be heavier than air flight. At the beginning of the 20th century, everybody was trying to solve this problem. They had, a, you know, they had a basic understanding of the physics involved in terms of aerodynamics and, and lift and drag. Uh, and they now had a method of thrust because the internal combustion engine was uh, there and, and being refined. It was lighter than P-51 
previous steam engines. And so the basic pieces were all there and there was a race to see who would get there first. And interestingly enough though, there is a case where innovation does not necessarily track resources. There were some big well-funded efforts out there to solve this problem, the Smithsonian had one, but the people who first came up with the practical application that actually actually worked was two guys in a garage in Oak Gate, Ohio, the Wright brothers, who were basically, you know, bicycle mechanics, and uh, they didn't approach it, you know, uh, from a true theoretical standpoint. They didn't try to build an artificial bird. Uh, nature soft, heavier than air flight with bird wings and lifts and uh, flapping and dynamically changing um, the, the, uh, limbs uh, in reconfiguration in real time to create lift and thrust. Very elegant solution, but that's the solution you would come up with if evolutionary problem was, I have a four-limbed organism, how do I get it into the air? The Wright brothers kind of asked, we have all these bicycle parts here, <laughs> you know, can we, can we construct them into an airplane? And, and they did. But that one was, again, if they hadn't solved it, somebody else would have in the same time frame. So it was, so most, in most cases, there is a engineering tradition or, or uh, going along and uh, advances are made. Uh, and so they all depend on each other and learn from each other. But once in a while, an invention will come totally out of left field. That is, it's not to be sold in any tradition. It doesn't build on any tradition. It was just, a, you know, a serendipitous discovery or a flash of genius, or it came, it comes when they come. And, um, uh, you know, may, may, may or may not take hold. It doesn't have to happen then. It may never happen. The, one that comes to mind there would be an ancient Alexandria hero who basically invented the steam engine. He created a working prototype of a vessel on a on a uh, on a pivot with two little jets coming out of it. You fill it with water and you heat it below, and the, the water turns to steam, and it crossed rotary motion. So he built a working steam engine that successfully converted heat into rotary work motion. Now that could have gone on. There was no reason why. That didn't lead to steam powered vessels in the third century, uh, second century, whenever that was taking place. But it didn't, for whatever other reasons. I think that what New Sapiens has done is more of that latter kind of invention. It came together due to another of um, a series of serendipitous events. Um, and uh, un unexpected ones, and completely out, I wouldn't say completely outside of the mainstream, but it wasn't building that much on the traditions, uh, didn't build on previous advances in AI. It really, what it got from previous work in AI was really to find out what did not work. And I, I think that whole story is probably, uh, you know, best left to to another conversation uh, because it's it's fairly detailed and and also very interesting. But so, but when you see it from this perspective, uh, I will say that uh, I do think that in the scope of this conversation is to appreciate what it means to have a very radically different approach to solving the same problem. So we talked about the fact that the mainstream of AI and computer science or, and as artificial intelligence as a, a subset of computer science is that um, the, the idea of imitation, imitating human intelligence. Well, the problem is that is sometimes by imitating something, you can create an illusion of what you're trying, uh, of what you're trying to create, which is not necessarily the real thing. And uh, a good example of that would be an imitation diamond in the sense of costume jewelry uh, it looks like a diamond, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, um, and uh, uh, people can mistake it for a diamond. The fact it's, that's the intent is that you will mistake it for a diamond. And uh, they've done pretty well there, but that's not the same thing as a real diamond, because it doesn't, it isn't a diamond. Diamonds are defined by their carbon crystal lattice and their properties of hardness and clarity and things like that. 
that uh, artificial gluey does not have. Um, so the approach of Eusapiens was not to imitate human intelligence, but to do something very different. Um, and we, we couldn't have done it without first asking kind of a different question, or maybe more importantly, going back to first principles, instead of starting with some conjecture about how human intelligence works, we asked ourselves a very different question, was, well, what is intelligence from a functional standpoint that it is desirable uh, to put into machines? What is it? Not how it works in the brain, or how it even might work at computers initially, but what is it? And going back to those first principles, you realize that intelligence, if we took from a functional standpoint, well, first of all, is what distinguishes human beings from the other species uh, that we are we know about in, in the universe, but particularly on Earth. Uh, and what it, that is clearly is that we are the species, the only species that extensively can alter uh, our environment, our external environment. Uh, to suit us, rather than being of necess uh, necessarily having to adapt to the environment itself. And when you evolve to a given environment and that environment changes and it takes many years to evolve, it's very hard to do that. That's why so many species have evolved and then become extinct because the climate always changes. So we are kind of have the ultimate survival mechanism. If we don't like our environment, we change it to be more comfortable to us and the nature that we have, that we are for practical purposes stuck with over the reasonable periods of time. And how does that work? Again, functionally, not from an information processing in a neural network, but functionally. Well, we can envision a world that doesn't exist yet and then go out and we can, we can envision the results of our actions and what they may be with some accuracy and we can try things and learn through, through experiment and trial and error. So what is that going on? Well, it's our knowledge of the world. Where, where do we envision things? It's in our heads, in our minds. And what do we have in there? We have a representation, if you like, or a model of, a reflection of is a better word, uh, of, of reality. So from, from a functional standpoint, uh, intelligence, in a machine or in a, in a human brain or any organism is the capacity to create and apply uh, an internal model that is knowledge, create knowledge of the external world and apply it to solve external problems. That's intelligence. That's what we want in a machine. If it has that functionality, it is true intelligence, just a, it would be a true intelligence in uh, a human being. So New Sapiens, we call that, attempt, that approach, not imitations, in, uh, or artificial intelligence, but synthetic intelligence. And again, the diamond analogy, if it's a perfect example, if not only an analogy, um, same class of problem, a synthetic diamond created in the laboratory is a real diamond, just as real as a natural diamond because it has the same crystal lattice. So our approach is, we don't know how the human mind works, we don't know how human intelligence works. Question, can we figure out how to synthesize knowledge and put it in a computer. That is completely contrarian and totally outside the mainstream. And we only have that insight due, due to a number of unusual and serendipitous discoveries and occurrences that didn't have to happen, but did. <laughs>